Welcome to the What You Next podcast. In this podcast, your host, Lori Ami, will interview published authors to chat about their work, journey to getting published, and their book recommendations. If you share a passion for books and always looking for your next read, then join us. Hi, Georgia. Welcome to What You Next podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. So happy to have you here. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, my name's Georgia Clark. I am Australian, but I live in Brooklyn with my wife and I've been in New York for, I moved here in 2009, so feels like forever. New mm-hmm. York is home and I am an author and I also am the founder and host of a storytelling series called Generation Women, where we invite a woman in her 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s plus to tell an original story on a theme. And we're a monthly series. We're virtual now, but we're getting back to live shows soon. Knock on wood. Oh my gosh. So we're going to talk more about this because I'm so curious about it. But first, like I live in New York from 2006 to 2020, right before the pandemic. And mm-hmm. so I'm familiar with New York. What part of Brooklyn are you in? Like, or, like neighborhood wise, like, you, you know, like the high level. We're in Williamsburg. Ooh, I love Williamsburg. That's like really good neighborhoods, like a lot of artists, a lot of like, entrepreneurs yes Ray Bodegas and yeah Rosa. it's very fun lots of great places to eat and hang and you know spend my extended adolescence <laughs> yes yes I have to admit like I there are times I miss New York and I'm like oh my gosh I'm in Chicago now I moved to I needed a I was looking for more space <laughs> and so mm-hmm. Chicago meant that I get winters but I still stay connected to New York and I love it. I love the energy. I think it's like a, it's a really creative energy that it's hard to find other places. So. Yeah. I love it. Uh, So talk to us about generation women, generation women. Is that what it is? Or Mm -hmm. talk to us about like, um, like how do you, how do you get started? I started the night in 2017. I, had actually, when I first moved to New York, I got deep into improv. Mm -hmm. I took a one-on-one, like a one-on-one class. I thought I would just do like an eight-week class at UCB because, you know, I just moved to New York. I didn't know anyone. It felt like the kind of thing to do, the New York adventure. Mm -hmm. And improv, I think it's kind of got more of a scene in Sydney now. But when I moved here, there was no improv scene. Like I had never really seen it before. Mm -hmm. And from seeing my first couple of shows, I was in total awe of this amazing art form. It's still my favorite art form. And Mm -hmm. I got deep into the improv scene. I was doing, there was like a period of years where (laughs) all I was doing was classes, going to see improv, hanging out with improvisers, like full comedy nerd. Ended up getting on a house team at UCB, surrounded by everyone else at that level wants to be like a professional comedian because yeah, you've worked really hard and I was just like wow this is a hobby that's gotten way out of control because <laughs> I do not want to be a professional comedian I want to be a writer and eventually after that kind of came to an end I did like improv for like seven years I missed doing live shows but didn't want to do live comedy like improv comedy anymore I wanted something a little more structured and I love storytelling. I'm a storyteller. So the idea of Generation Women came about because I wanted to be in a multi-generational space. And I had been talking with my mom about the experience of disappearing as an older woman. Mm-hmm. She shared with me that as she gets older, she feels like people are just looking right through her. She's going into shops or just on the street. She's sort of being erased from society. And it made me so mad and sad because my mom is awesome. And Mm -hmm. I wanted to create a space where all women could come. And of course, our definition of women is inclusive Mm -hmm. and diversity is um, really important. So that's how Generation Women came about. And it has grown into this really thriving, committed community of people it's and it's very special it really means a lot to me we've done virtual shows through the pandemic but we'll get back to live shows as soon as we can and new york's actually opening up for small live shows pretty soon Mm -hmm. but it's a a wonderful thing to have started um to be a part of especially because like as a novelist i only get to do this kind of thing once every two or three years if i'm lucky Mm -hmm. and i'm just a bit too social for that (laughs) so it's a way for me to stay 
kind of connected to the community and performing and being out there and having something, some fun to talk about every month. So which you see, and so you start UCB or did you start with a pet or a magnet, which improv? I did UCB. Yeah. I was and very loyal to, um, to UCB. And at the time, uh, so like 2010 to like 2016, it was a really exciting time mm-hmm. for the theater. I feel like the theater was in a real high spot. I mean, you would go and see like Zach Woods and all of these like Neil Casey, all of these great performers for five bucks, like on these powerhouse yeah. <laughs> improv teams making magic before our very eyes. And it was, and I just, I really love improvisers. I love I love comedians in general, but improvisers are such team players and mm-hmm. they're, the whole way it works is by supporting each other on stage. Mm-hmm. And so I just found by nature, improvisers were very generous human beings and really just wanted to play and laugh and have fun and be supportive and support each other. And I just met, you know, obviously have still really close friends and and a lot of ties and connections to the comedy community and it was really one of the best things I've ever done I think I love it yeah I took a class with I think magnet no pet the pet actually Mm -hmm. I took the eight week course and I loved it it was so great like it was like really awareness of who you are as a person within the team what your role is and like how you actually play around like the games and how do you actually be part of it and create connections and at the same time just feeling it and so one of the things I want to then miss out like things to the pandemic was that I wanted to take classes like second study since I'm in Chicago and they were like they went virtual and I was like it's not the same as like being in person and so now that it's opening up I think I'm may I think I'm telling you and telling out loud that I'm just gonna look for a class and sign up because it'll, it'll be great to have human interaction too so I love improv so, yeah you should Oh my gosh, this is so exciting. I love this. So tell us, so what inspired you to start to become an author? And like within like your genre, like what what made you decide to write within the genre of like women's fiction with some moments? Like what was, were you a reader beforehand or were something you were like, I actually like my stories to look this way? Yeah, it's such an interesting question. I was a reader from a young age. We didn't have TV growing up. Um, my parents were uh, kind of anti-television. So I was a huge reader as a kid. And, you know, some of my earliest memories are of the visceral pleasure of being lost in a story. Mm-hmm. Give me five, you know, preteens adventuring around the English countryside with a dog, like getting into scrapes and I'm on board, still am. And I wanted to be a filmmaker when I was at school. I went to university for film, for screenwriting and filmmaking, and I made a couple of films and was sort of trying to get into that space. But Australia's industry all of industries are pretty small and I wasn't having much luck. I also was pretty pig-headed, probably in retrospect, I wasn't really listening to um, some of the advice being given to me. It's another story. And then when I landed in New York, I was 29 and I had originally planned to write a, a feature film screenplay that was like I was going to come to New York for three months and write a feature film screenplay. That was my big plan. Mm-hmm. And very early on, I realised that a lot of other people were making feature films, writing feature film screenplays and I had already had a young adult novel published in Australia, a small novel, um, like a 50,000 word, like YA. And um, I just felt like what I really want to do is tell stories. That's what gets me going. And that's what I've always wanted to do. I love seeing things in my head and, you know, getting them out and that writing novels would be a way that I could do that. That would be frankly cheaper and easier than being a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And so I then wrote a YA that didn't sell. I wrote a very complicated sci-fi action adventure YA that sold for a tiny bit of money. And then I sort of rejigged my entire plan and was like, okay, I got to like focus here. I have to write something that actually sells for a decent amount of money because these things take so long to do and are Mm -hmm. so difficult. And went into what the book that then was, became the regulars, my first book with Simon & Schuster in a very much more sort of structured way. I hired a developmental editor who I still work with to this day, who really transforms my writing. And 
that's kind of my windy path into getting to where I am now. It had to be you, which my, which is my book that's coming out um, yeah, May four. Is uh, and I'm not sure if this is going to be out. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be out by publication week. So, <laughs> okay, yeah. great. It's my first rom com, and I've written stories, the bucket list and the regulars, which was my two books that I wrote before it had to be you both had romantic subplots, like romantic mm-hmm. storylines, but they weren't by definition a romantic comedy. I love romantic comedy as a genre. It's very sophisticated, very smart, very fun, very sexy, all of the things we, you know, all of the the sort of pleasurable things about it. But I think because the genre is so overstaffed, like you really have to stand out in a way that's very, um, yeah, like sophisticated and and that holds up a mirror to life and that shows us something about people and love. Mm-hmm. I love love. I love first kisses. I love crushes. I love all of that stuff. But then I also am really interested in what sustains love. How do two people stay in relationship with each other over a longer period of time? And I'm, I've been with my partner for eight years. And so I'm constantly thinking about how do we do it? Like, what is the secret to success? Like what changes am I observing in myself and in her and in us? And it's, I, I think that stuff's really interesting. So it really is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love the rom-com. I love like, it was like all these multiple characters just coming together. Like it was a sense of like, there's like a newness that happens. Cause like I read romance mainly. So that's like my, my bread and butter is romance. And so I love that it was like a fresh take on it. Like I was like, oh, you know, like, and the, and, you know, the beginnings, like her husband dies, you know, like there's all these different narratives that happen. So tell us like an elevator pitch of what, it had to be you. Yeah. So It Had to Be You is a uh, modern romantic comedy set in New York that centers around two mismatched wedding planners uh, for the past 20 years, Liv and her husband, Elliot Goldenhorn, have run a wedding planning business called In Love in New York. It's one of Brooklyn's top wedding planning businesses. Then Elliot dies in an unexpected way and even more unexpectedly leaves his half of the business to his younger blonder girlfriend Savannah who didn't know Elliot was married and Liv and Savannah are polar opposites Liv's a cynical New Yorker Savannah is a bright-eyed bushy-tailed southern girl and what starts as this sort of personal and professional nightmare for Liv evolves into something that she couldn't begin to imagine and the story revolves around five love stories Liv and Savannah both have a love story and then the love stories of the wedding vendors the musicians and the florists and the caterers and the DJ and everyone who works these weddings these regular weddings with Liv and Savannah who are sort of slowly rebuilding this company that they both own and circling around each other becoming you know well I won't spoil it for you but Mm -hmm. uh, getting to know each other Mm -hmm. and I think what really interested me about this idea was I, I I was interested in updating the kind of love actually style of storytelling. I like love actually, you know, we all like love actually, but as everyone will tell you, like it doesn't really stand the test of time. When you watch it again now with a, you know, modern lens, it's a lot of straight white male fantasies about women with very little agency and there's very little diversity in the story. So I wanted to take the idea of these, intertwining love stories with an overall like hopeful uh, like funny you know lens but make the couples more modern and so the couples within it had to be you are diverse across like you know sexuality and age and race and background and and sort of I think and I think that makes the story much richer because it's more of an insight into how people are in partnership and how people are um, in love, of course, these characters all have specific baggage and back, their backgrounds, you know, change their attitudes to the story, which I think is interesting to think about. But I wanted to write something that was hopeful and that would make people feel good, but that was also hopefully smart and um, <laughs> and felt truly of the time. It did. I think it just like I felt like. I don't know. I just love love actually, and I know like it's it doesn't t- stand the test of time, but I love just remanaging, you know, love actually, and and what would happen in New York, you know, like mm-hmm. and what would happen with weddings and like such a like 
you know, looking at the wedding industry in a different way. Like it just, it felt like, it felt fresh. Like that's what it does. Like it felt like a fresh story that I wanted to tell my friends that they should read, you know? So. Oh, please do. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. That's where we're here. Yay. (laughs) Yay. So talking of the wedding industry, like, did you, what kind of research did you conduct to figure out like all the logistics, you know? Yeah. I'm, um, I'm a big researcher. I've done various degrees of research for every book, some pretty intense. Um, And for this one, I was actually getting married over the course of writing the book. So over the course of ideating and writing the book, I proposed to my then girlfriend, now wife, and we together planned and had our wedding. So part of my research was actually going through what Savannah, uh, the character who kind of comes into the situation, who's quite naive about wedding planning and what sort of her idea of love is also quite naive. Mm -hmm. I was going through this evolution with her, (laughs) reflective through her, which was understanding how not just complicated wedding planning is, but it's very complicated emotionally. Um, Everyone who's gotten married will know what I'm talking about. Uh, There's a lot going on. There's a lot of um, balls in the air. There's a lot of people that you're trying to kind of satisfy. You're basically having to plan like a family reunion, a weekend away with friends, um, a massive party, you know, a sort of a semi-religious or, you know, your version of spiritual event that reflects your identity as a couple, as a married couple, which you aren't even yet without going broke or mad. I mean, it's tough. So not only was I in it, but I did a lot of research as well with wedding planners and with wedding vendors. I, the first kind of, I always like making an unusual, (laughs) I I had a great first interaction with a wedding photographer. We shared an Uber pool. Her name was Aaliyah and I was just in a bit of a chatty mood and I was like, oh, yeah, where are you going? What are you up to? My Australianism kind of coming out. Let's have a chat. And and I was like, oh, you're a wedding photographer. I'm kind of researching a book about wedding planning. And so I took her out for lunch a couple of days later in Greenpoint and she just like dished the dirt on being a wedding vendor, what that kind of meant, what it meant to work in the business of love, which I think is very interesting because when you're in the business of love, when you're supporting other people's love stories all the time, how does that affect your own understanding of love? I think that's like a Mm -hmm. kind of fun paradox. And then she connected me to a few other wedding planners, uh, which was great. I was able to interview them, some in person here in New York, some were out of state. I connected with a wedding planning company called Modern Rebel, who is a Brooklyn-based uh, wedding planning company they let me come along a moonlight on one of their weddings as an assistant so I was able to get a true behind the scenes look into arriving when all the staff are arriving like before the guests get there and just being at a certain remove from one of the most important events of a person's life which is a really unusual space to be in because usually at a wedding I you know I've never worked as a wedding vendor before so all of my experiences of weddings of being a guest or being you know married Mm -hmm. so being on the outside of something like that where it's just the stakes are so high people are you know professing their love for each other and you're sort of standing there in all black like waiting to take a plate away or something (laughs) it was um you know it was it was great and I I really like that I like stepping into someone else's shoes like that's my whole job really is to think about what life would be like for someone else. And so that was the sort of research that I did for that. There was there was um, a couple of the characters and musicians. I have a friend, I've got lots of friends who are musicians, but I kind of had one key contact who was really helping with making the dynamic of what it would be like if you were in a band with someone that you also had feelings for, but, you know, it was also your job to work with them. And again, like, performing performing love performing um at all of these you know super emotional events together that was fun and uh but yeah I I think research is really in, it's invaluable and it really enriches your writing and I think a lot of writers are sort of nervous about it but I've found my experience is that people really like talking about their jobs. Often you're just researching someone's like profession or an experience that's happened to them. Mm -hmm. And most people are really forthcoming. If you understand, if you explain like what you're looking for and that you're a writer and you're just looking to make the work more authentic, people are really into that and they're very generous with their time. 
Yes, I I think I, I, I'm in the business of interviewing people, and so yes, it's most people like to talk about what they enjoy, what they're passionate about, what they do for a living. You know, even the stuff that they hate, they might like talking about that, and letting you know, like here's the warning signs, here's what I don't like. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love this. So I have to tell you, I absolutely adore the bucket list, and so I. Can you tell us a little bit about that process? Because that's a unique story. That's a more women's fiction. There's a romantic element. Um, and there's, you know, there's some questions, you know. Um, can you tell us, like, for the for our listeners who have not read the book of this, can you tell us a little elevator pitch about it? And then we'll chat a little bit about it. Yeah, so the bucket list is about a 25-year-old woman named uh, Lacey who is diagnosed with the BRCA1 gene mutation, Mm -hmm. which puts her at statistically a much higher chance of getting breast cancer at some point in her life. And she is then faced with the decision of what to do to either have ongoing surveillance for the rest of her life or, as is one one option, having a preventative mastectomy. Mm-hmm. And I wrote this book. I had a, a cancer scare of my own. My doctor found a lump on my breast when I was in Sydney on my press tour for the regulars. And on the same day that I was doing all of my big press moments, like a live t- like live TV and my book launch and a presentation to all of Simon and Schuster, I went in to um, have my had this lump checked out, like in the middle of this day, crazy day, and really put everything into stark relief of like maybe none of this really matters and and in the end the lump was benign but the fear and the what if stayed with me you know because that what if moment is your you think you're on a track like my main character thinks she's on this track that she's worked very hard to get onto um and this diagnosis just skews her right off her path and and she creates a boob bucket list of all the things she wants to do with and for her beautiful boobies before a possible surgery, which she still hasn't made her mind up about. So I also wanted to write something that was about a very real women's health issue and a decision that a lot of, not a, I mean, young women and women mm-hmm. of all ages, but you know, young women can make, mm-hmm. which to me is an incredibly difficult decision, but in a way that was, sexy and funny that's my thing you know Mm -hmm. so I it was it was a challenge to um and to bring this story to life about a diagnosis that I actually hadn't had and that was so when I say like some research is more intense than others that was the most intensive research that I've ever done because I made connections with um pre-vivors which is Mm -hmm. what we call women who have preventative mastectomies if you're a pre-vivor survivor pre-vivor and was very involved with the community and you know um obviously you can read a lot of books and podcasts and essays and things but I really like talking to people that's like how I get information and get real information you know as a writer you're always looking for like authentic specific like it has to be has to feel real and sometimes those details are not what you would assume that's what makes writing feel like like it's really real and so I, you know, I had a blast of that book and it was a, it was, it was such a, I guess, privilege to be in, in Lacey's shoes. I think she's a lot braver than I am to follow her on her journey. And um, because this diagnosis like upsets her entire life and her, what she thinks, where she thinks her career is going, where she thinks her like love life is going and all of these things suddenly kind of open up and split and change in a really, um, fascinating way so thank you for reading it I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it I love it I'm a sucker for any books I had a book of this <laughs> I'm so sorry like and then this was like such a treat like I love Lacey's journey because I think it put you know when we have moments when we have those scares in our lives like put everything in perspective and you start to observe like your life you take a step back and you're like okay what works, what doesn't work, what would be exciting, what would be, what would I try, what would be outside of my comfort zone, and I felt like I can, I can, even though I did not have that scare, I had other scares in my life that I have put that, you know, in perspective, and so it was, a, it was a fun journey just to be in Lacey's shoes, and just seeing her grow in her character arc, and just go through the process, so 
I really loved it. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for writing it. Hey, you're welcome. So what are you working next? Is there is there another book coming up? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, I'm in second draft right now of my next book, which I'm very excited about. I'm really in love with this book. Uh, I can't say too much about it because I'm too it's too close, but it's um it's my my take on a lockdown novel, lockdown without being a lockdown, and it's about two families who have nothing in common except for the fact that their daughters are married, who get stranded in a beautiful wild setting, um, and it's another ensemble story, mm-hmm. so similar to it had to be you, which has ten. God, like five couples, 10 characters. This has nine characters um, and it is has a queer rom-com at the giant beating heart of it. And even though I've written, I've in all of my stories, there's some sort of queer element to them, but I've never had a central queer love story. Mm-hmm. And as I was putting It Had to Be You together, it kind of struck me all of a sudden. I was like, I'm such a bad gay. Like, how have I not written a queer love story between two girls uh, like that, you know, take me out of, of queer land. So I'm really excited to have a like gorgeous, funny, sexy story between two women at the center of this book, which is also a book that's not set in New York. I started writing in lockdown and New York was, you know, pretty grim, (laughs) pretty grim the last um, year. And I just couldn't, it would not have been right to have written like a peppy New York Mm -hmm. story because it just wasn't the New York that I was living in. Mm -hmm. And I also didn't want to write a story about the New York that I was living in because it was too depressing. Mm -hmm. Um, So I really the question I asked myself was, okay, well, where do I want to live in my imagination for the next, you know, year and a half, couple of years, which is how long you're like really actively drafting for. And the answer is the location that the book is set in. And it's so gorgeous and beautiful. And it's in Australia, which is my home. So it it's just such a pleasure to be there. And it's the first time that I've really engaged with nature writing. I haven't done really nature writing before it was I, I love reading it but I've never really attempted it and my editor's really into it so it'll you know it'll have a strong nature component to it well count me in and you should come back next year or in two years whenever it comes out you should come back and talk to us all about it because I'm I like will. I'm dying to get that book now <laughs> <laughs> so um so let's check that book recommendations is there a book that you have read this past year or last year that you recommend so the book I just finished reading was and I'm sure many of your listeners have read this book because it was everywhere and I'm a little late to the party was leave the world behind by Riman Alam mm-hmm. it was it's a it's an amazing novel it's incredibly there's so everything about it works but on a line level it's so precise and finely tuned and because I'm in editing mode right now, it's such a great guide for me. I'm just like absorbing all of Ruman's amazing wisdom and insight. He's such a good writer. And I reread or read for the first time everything Karen Russell wrote over lockdown. Uh, she Her big novel was Swamplandia, but she really shines as a short story writer. And I think Vampire's in the lemon grove is my favorite short story collection like ever and she is such a freaky genius she is a really like quirky doesn't even do her justice she is a genius um and just very imaginative unusual short stories and i i love her (laughs) i love her uh and her new book is orange world which is great and um uh, St. Lucy's Home for Girls Raised by Wolves was, I think, her first collection, which is also brilliant. I think she published it when she was 25. I mean, when I was 25, I could barely string a sentence together. So, <laughs> yeah, she's amazing. I love her. The book I'm reading right now is a is a, a bird book, which is nothing I don't think that anyone's going to be interested in, but it's called The Genius of Birds mm-hmm. by Jennifer Ackerman because I'm doing one of my characters is a birder in this new book, and it's a lot about nature and evolution and things like that so I'm that's what I'm actually reading right now is um I mean deep in my bird books 
Oh my gosh, I love this so much. <laughs> so tell us where you can find you online. Uh, so my website is georgiaclark.com. No surprises there. I'm unfortunately on Instagram, Georgia Lou Clark, too much time on Instagram, but I will find you there. Um, come and hang out with me. And uh, Generation Women is generationwomen.us. So you can catch our virtual shows or come and see a show in New York very soon. And of course, my book is available from all good bookstores. I don't care where you buy it from, but if you want perfect full marks, then please support your local independent bookstore and you can buy online through bookshop.org, which will wing you a copy without going to, um, you know, the bad place where we conveniently buy books, but probably shouldn't. I love this. Thank you, Georgia, for being at a show. Ah, you're so welcome. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this podcast, feel free to share with friends, subscribe, rate, and review the show. This is the easiest way to support the podcast. For book recommendations, author interview archives, and other fun book resources and tips, please visit watchreadnextblog.com. The Watch Read Next podcast is part of the Frolic Network. To discover new shows to listen and love, please visit frolic.media slash podcast. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.